Hey guys, I miss you so much. I hope things are going good. Um, I'm sorry for the way the last few weeks have been panning out, but hopefully things will get better and we can get back in the classroom. For at least the next three weeks, though, we're going to be covering some new material via Zoom. So we'll, we will see how that goes. Um, we, let's see, the plan for next week, is, or technically this week by the time you'll see this video, is y'all are going to be going over internal and external parasites. Um, we're just going to pick up right where we left off, which we were going to be going over parasites. Um, Y'all are going to be using the Unit 6 PowerPoint and the Unit 6 Notes. I'm going to put those on Edmodo um, so that y'all will be able to use them. If you want to print everything out, you are welcome to. If you don't, then you can just end up using the PowerPoint. Um, we are going to have an assignment every day after the lecture. So Monday, what you guys are going to be working on is I'm going to be going over slides 25 through 47. And at the end of that, y'all are going to start working on the livestock diagnosis assignment. Um, you're not going to have all the answers up until this point because it does continue into what we're going to end up covering on Wednesday. So answer what you can on the livestock disease assignment. And then you're going to end up finishing it either the 8th or the 10th. Um, we are close to finishing Unit 6, so yes you see the test up there. Um, we're going to try to handle it the same way. It might take a little bit of practice. I'm not even sure exactly how I'm going to set it up yet. Um, but be prepared for us to have a unit six test with a review guide, of course. Um, but let's move on to the PowerPoint. Um, here is what y'all's assignment is going to look like, though. Eight questions. Um, picking up, though, slide 25 is this first one right here. Um, a little bit on viruses, bacteria, basically different disease-causing agents. And then we're going to end up focusing on internal and external parasites. Um, viruses. Super common, we are dealing with one right now with this coronavirus. Um, a virus, it's a contagious disease that spreads some which way through the environment. Um, the thing that makes viruses different is that it can only live inside a host cell. That's why it's really important that we're maintaining social distance, that we're washing our hands, that we're only leaving the house if we really need to in hopes that we don't come in contact with it because it literally needs us to continue living. Um, other common viruses, the flu. That's why I worry. we always try to get a flu shot every year to protect us from this virus. Um, a virus, it needs to live inside a body in order to get nourishment. It can't survive outside. That's why we're quarantining right now. If we can keep as many people inside, then there's less people outside that the virus can end up infecting and then just prolonging it. If we can just stay inside, then we can go on ahead and beat this, hopefully. Um, viruses, you don't treat them with antibiotics, obviously. Um, all you can really do is kind of treat the symptoms or make the patient comfortable. Fluid replacement, because dehydration is going to be really common. Pain management, depending on what virus it is and what's hurting. Um, antipyretics, like aspirin to relieve a fever. Um, and then any other medications, like if the virus is making you throw up or if it's giving diarrhea, um, just trying to treat the symptoms until the body ends up getting rid of the virus. Other disease causing agents are gonna be bacteria. This is the one where we need antibiotics. Um, bacteria, they're single celled organisms, and there's a couple different kinds or a couple different categories. Um, first one, beneficial flora. This is like the Activia commercial, where that woman is telling you to drink your Activia to get your probiotics. Probiotics are just a nice, not scary way of saying, make sure you get the good bacteria inside your body. Um, beneficial flora, in the example we're talking about, are going to be the they sit 
in the intestines and they sit in the stomach and they try to help aid us in digestion. Things that our body may struggle to break down, the bacteria is able to help. Um, there's also not so good bacteria called a pathogenic bacteria. Um, pathogenic bacteria, they typically um, they only come up when something bad is already happening, when an animal is hurt and the wound gets infected. Um, or they, the animal is compromised in some kind of way. The bacteria sees its opportunity and it goes in. Um, continuing, um, fungal diseases, ringworm, that's what this poor little kitty right here has gotten. Um, fungal disease, they're not super common in other places of the world. They're relatively common where we live because fungus likes warm, moist environments. And honestly, if that's not a way to describe North Carolina, I don't know what is. Um, ringworm, really common. Um, it can be difficult to treat just because if you don't continue the treatment or if your animal doesn't continue the treatment all the way through for the time that it's been prescribed and you just have one little spore of fungus that didn't get killed, it's going to sit there and it's going to regrow. Um, I've had ringworm. We know this. When I had ringworm, it was a pain to get rid of because as soon as you think it's gone for good, it just comes right back. Like I was having to put athlete's foot cream, it was on my arm. I'm over here having to put athlete's foot cream on my arm for like three or four weeks because I finally just hit the point where I was like, I'm gonna put this on every single day of my life because enough is never enough, apparently. Um, it can be difficult to treat the fungal disease. There is different fungal diseases that can infect the insides of the animals. Um, if y'all remember in animal science too, we talked about blastomycosis and that's a fungus that the animal breathes in and it ends up infecting the lungs. I don't know if y'all can hear the plane go over my house. I'm really sorry. Um, but the fungus will infect the animal's lungs. It can be really, really hard to try to sit there and get every little bit of the disease because you can't exactly look into the lungs and see whether or not you've gotten every single bit of it. protozoal disease. A protozoa or protozoan is a single cell parasite. Um, coccidiosis, which we're going to talk about a little bit later into this PowerPoint. Toxoplasmosis, which we talked about in Animal Science 2. Um, it's just a really, really, really tiny parasite that lives in the animal. Um, it can live in different places. Forget seal diseases. Um, this is a disease that's carried or carried and spread by ticks and fleas. Um, Think about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. That's a disease that we can only get from ticks because ticks are the ones that carry it. And finally getting into like fully parasites. Um, Parasitology is the study of organisms that live in or on other organisms to survive. So basically, it's the study of internal and external parasites. Um, a parasite, as we know, is an animal that has to live off of another animal in order to survive. Um, they all have different life cycles, but essentially, especially for the internal ones, you can see in this little diagram. The animal is infected, it poops, the eggs are shed in the feces, they grow in the environment, and then they end up growing onto the plants or whatever it is. Typically, it's gonna be an animal that has to eat the grass or eat whatever it's infected of. Um, so the cow having to eat all the grass or hay or whatever it is eating, is going to poop in the same place. The larva is going to grow and the cow is going to come back for a snack and end up getting reinfected or it's going to end up infecting another animal. Um, you can control it and prevent it with good sanitation, 
So if it's going to be shed through the feces, what do you do? You get rid of the feces. Um, a lot of times producers to do this, they'll have separate pastures and they'll rotate pastures. They'll have their cows in field number one for two weeks and then they're going to move to field number two, move to field number three and so on. So that hopefully it gives, if they're infected with parasites, it gives those parasites enough time to die in the environment without having a host. Um, so we'll go over internal parasites for right now. Um, internal parasites can infect anyone and anything, small and large animals. Um, so it should say, round worms, not ringworms, because we don't know that a ringworm is not an internal parasite. Um, glad that I caught that. It can include round worms, whip worms, hook worms, heart worms, da, 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 da. there's a ton of them, is the bottom line. Um, typically most internal parasites are going to end up living in the digestive system somewhere. Typically somewhere in the small intestine because the small intestine is where nutrient absorption happens. So if they live in the small intestines, it's like a buffet. You sit down and your food just, it's all right here. Um, or it's almost like having room service. You just sit in your room and the food is brought right to you. You don't have to do anything. Um, so you can end up seeing animals losing weight. You can see their hair coat um, getting less shiny, start falling out, looking really dull. Um, you'll see diarrhea because those internal parasites are taking away the animal's nutrients. They're eating enough food that they should be maintaining where they're at, but for some reason they're losing. So the first one is roundworms. Um, because they're probably one of the more common worms that we see. Um, a lot of times you're gonna see worms in young animals and roundworms live in the small intestine. Again, it's like room service. Those roundworms just hang out in the small intestine and the food is brought right to them. They don't even have to do anything. Um, part of the reason that roundworms are so common is due to how many eggs they can lay. A mature adult roundworm can lay 200,000 eggs per day. So you got the mature roundworms in the animal, the eggs are shed in the feces, they hatch in the environment and grow into larvae, and then they're re-ingested. It could be by a dog, it could be by a cat, it could be by a cow, whatever it is, they're shed in the environment and they're re-ingested by something else so that they can end up continuing that life cycle and maturing in the animal's digestive system. Um, You'll see vomiting, diarrhea, bloated stomach. Um, you can see these symptoms with a lot of different things when animals are sick. So a lot of times, especially with internal parasites, you're gonna wanna do a fecal float or you're gonna wanna check their feces. Because if they have worms, you're gonna see the eggs in the feces. Or you might get really lucky and see the whole adults coming out in the feces. Um, So in your notes, if you are taking them on the paper, you guys should have little squares beside each different type of internal parasite. In those little squares, I'm wanting you guys to draw what the egg looks like because there's tons of different internal parasites and they all look pretty, they can look really similar if you don't know what you're looking for. So the first one is the Toxicaris leon leonina. Yeah. Um, this one is first because it has a pretty simple life cycle. The eggs hatch after it's eaten, and then the eggs are also passed in the feces. So, and it only takes literally less than a week for the eggs to hatch into larvae and be ready to infect another animal. Um, a lot of times you're gonna see this in like foxes or dogs. You can end up seeing them in some rodents. But honestly, this roundworm is not super picky about who it infects. The Toxocara canis. Think canis like canine. So typically, these roundworms are going to be seen in dogs or someone in the canine family. 
Um, these roundworms, they're really resistant to dewormers. They're hard to get rid of. They live a long time in the environment. So not exactly the best roundworm to have to come in contact with. Um, they actually, they will end up migrating through the circulatory system. And if they get stuck somewhere, they can just hatch, or not hatch themselves, but insist themselves into the body tissues and they can just hang out. So if they end up insisting somewhere in the body and you give that animal dewormer, it's like they're in their own little fortress. That dewormer isn't going to flush them out because it's not necessarily going to where they are. If they're migrating through the circulatory system and you give them a dewormer that's going to go through their digestive system, it's not going to get anywhere near them, which is part of the reason that they're so hard to get rid of because they might not even be necessarily where you're expecting them to be. They can make a pit stop at any point in the circulatory system and insist themselves in the walls. Toxicara cati, similar to the canis. Um, the eggs, they're once again swallowed by the animal. The larva will hatch and they're going to penetrate the stomach wall. That does not sound like a lot of fun. Um, with the cat eye, the larva is going to migrate to the liver. They can end up going into other tissues. They can make their way to the lungs. Not the funnest situation for an animal to have to deal with. This is, it makes it really difficult to get rid of them if they're migrating all throughout the body. All right, so Periscaris equorum. Um, Equorum is similar to the word equine, meaning horse. So a lot of times, even though the Periscaris equorum can infect large and small animals, a lot of times you're going to see them in large animals. Um, they can be spread through contaminated feed or contaminated water. So this is where sanitation becomes really, really important. You've got to make sure you're cleaning up any feces that's left behind. Um, when we had the goats on campus, they loved to just poop everywhere. They would poop in their food bowl. They're going to poop in their water bucket. <sighs> so we have to make sure that there wasn't any... Oh, I just on my computer. Um, oh, my God. Um, you have to make sure that the feed buckets are cleaned out and the water buckets are cleaned out as well. We don't want any lingering feces spread or just hanging out where the animals are going to be eating or drinking. The Periscaris equorum, they're going to mature in the intestines. They're going to lay eggs. They're going to pass in the feces as roundworms typically do. Whipworms. Um, with whipworms, they're going to, um, they look pretty similar to roundworms, whereas roundworms look like a piece of spaghetti. They're one long noodle. Whipworms are going to look similar to that, except they're going to be a little bit broader at one end, and then they're going to go and they're going to get skinny. Um, they're pretty common, and they live in the large intestine. So the large intestine is where water gets absorbed out of whatever is left that hasn't been digested and absorbed. So when you have whip, when your animal has whipworms, you're gonna see diarrhea because if it's in the large intestine, the large intestine isn't able to fully do its job, meaning you're gonna have some liquidy poop on your hands. Um, and also because they live in the large intestine, that's pretty close to the exit point. You can end up seeing them in the feces. Um, Um, then you look at the eggs. Notice that we are out of the roundworm category. This is not a round egg that we are seeing. Um, the whipworms eggs, when you do a fecal float, they're going to end up looking like a football. They're very oblong and oval shaped. Hookworms. Um, I have a picture of a hookworm on the next slide. Um, they live in the small intestine. 
if when in doubt, just guess that the worm is going to live in the small intestine because probably eight out of 10 times, that's where they're going to be at. Um, hookworms, though, rather than feeding off the nutrients that are coming through the body, they're feeding off of the blood. So they have kind of like that big worm that was on the SpongeBob episode that's just running through eating everything. That's kind of what the hookworm looks like except it's going to go and it's going to attach into the small intestine and it's going to start feeding off the blood and the tissues there. Typically, you're not going to see hookworms in large animals. You're going to see them in small animals like cats and dogs. And they're going to lay eggs, they get passed through the feces, so on and so forth. Typical life cycle. The thing about hookworms, though, is that they can end up leading to zoonotic disease, meaning they can be passed to us. Um, so the worms can end up burrowing through human skin. And yeah, that's where they're at. That man had a hookworm burrow into his skin. It's pretty gross. Thankfully, though, it's going to be only most common in young children, just because who walks around most commonly without shoes? kids because you can't get shoes on them um so heartworms y'all have probably seen and heard quite a bit about heartworms um just because heartworms they're really difficult to treat in an animal because it's not the safest thing to have to try to treat in an animal um so we'll start out with the heartworm life cycle. Um, heartworms, they're really, really common in the United States and especially in the Southeast United States because they're carried by mosquitoes. And where do mosquitoes live? Hot, humid, moist North Carolina. So the mosquitoes will end up biting an infected dog, drinking the blood, and that's where the heartworms live. They're float until they get mature they're floating in the bloodstream of the animal. So a mosquito comes back for a quick snack and accidentally sucks up some heartworms. The infected mosquito flies around, does his thing, doesn't even know any different, stops back for another snack. When he bites that next dog, there's also a little bit of this exchange going on where he's taking in some blood and, but he's not retaining all of it. It's like when you're sipping through a straw. You never get exactly what you're trying to sip up. So some of that blood goes back in and it's contaminated with the heartworm microfilaria. So the heartworms, the larvae, go into this poor new dog and he's now infected because he's not on prevention. And the larva will live in the pulmonary artery of the heart before they mature. Six months later when they're mature, then they're all good to go living in the heart and the lungs. And the cycle just continues. Um, let me move this over. I think we basically covered most of this. Um, they're really common in dogs. They can be common in cats. Um, typically, it's gonna be dogs though because there aren't too many outdoor cats. If you have an outdoor animal though, then you want to try to have them on a heartworm preventative so that they don't get bitten by a mosquito that's just kind of a risk that we take living here in North Carolina. Mosquitoes are super common, which means heartworms are also going to be very common. Um, so I used the term microfilaria earlier. The microfilaria is just a term for the tiny larvae that the adult heartworms lay in the heart. And they're what's being passed through that cycle. Um, another thing with heartworms is that you may not notice that your animal has them until it gets to almost like a breaking point where you're going to see your animal not wanting to move around, not wanting to exercise because it's having to share its arteries with heartworms. And instead of it being a one-way road where the blood can go where it needs to, it's having to sit here and dodge and swerve past all these heartworms, making it really, really difficult to keep the animal's blood oxygenated. So your animal's not gonna wanna get up, probably not gonna play too much. They may end up having some difficulty breathing and you're gonna see them coughing a lot because the reason that they're gonna cough is because they can't catch their breath. Um, thankfully though, we have the snap blood test 
made for diagnosing heartworms. Um, the treatment though is why we would rather have our animals on a preventative because the treatment is essentially a little bit of arsenic going through the animal's blood system to kill off the heartworms. Arsenic is still very deadly to animals like dogs and cats. So you don't, you have to keep your animal for at least six months or throughout the remainder of the animal's treatment. You have to make sure that they're not getting too much exercise essentially. Not getting too excited, not running around, not getting their heartbeat racing. Because when they get that heartbeat racing, it's causing an increase in the speed of the arsenic flowing through their system. And all that arsenic suddenly flowing through their system can end up causing them to go into heart failure and to die. So make sure your animal's on heartworm preventatives if they're not already. And this is just a chart showing the number of heartworm cases in the United States. Um, I think this was a couple years ago, maybe like 2017. Um, the darker the color, the more num the larger the number of cases. And we can see that the southeast is really dark because of how many mosquitoes we have. It's just the environment that we live in that it's ideal for mosquitoes. And if it's ideal for mosquitoes, the heartworms are also going to end up being here. We've got a few more sods um, going through the rest of internal parasites that we may see. Um, strong owls are really common in large animals, especially horses. Um, they just still follow that same um, life cycle of the eggs are going to go out in the feces, they're going to hatch in the larva, they're going to get re-ingested, so on and so forth. Um, the larva is going to mature in the intestinal tracts and they can end up causing damage to the blood vessels because they can end up migrating to other places. Um, they end up insisting, just like the other parasites that we've talked about. Um, so it can be really, it can be difficult to treat them because again, if they're not in the intestinal tract like they're supposed to be, then we're not going to end up catching them when we go and deworm the animal. Coccidia. Um, so when an animal is infected with an overabundance of coccidia, it's called coccidiosis. A lot of animals though, like livestock, like sheep and goats, they already have coccidia in their system because it's just that common. But we don't see the effects like diarrhea, blood, mucus present in their feces until there's an overabundance of coccidia in their system. Um, basically it for coccidia. Um, they're not super common until there's an overabundance of them in the system, but they are shed in the feces. And when you have animals that are grazers, like goats and sheep, that are constantly eating off the ground, when one animal gets an overabundance of coccidia, the rest of them can also end up developing it. Um, guardia. Another protozoa or single-celled organism, um, the guardia, they live in the intestinal tract of animals. And typically where you're gonna see guardia infections is gonna be contaminated water sources. Um, the way I always remember that guardia comes from water sources is that they, they kind of look like little squid or octopus. And those live in the water. Um, with Guardia though, you're gonna see the same symptoms that you're gonna see in just about every other internal parasite. Diarrhea, vomiting, weight loss, poor overall appearance. Um, you're gonna have to do a fecal flow to try to determine what parasite the animal has. And the last one, tapeworms, because we have to talk about tapeworms. Um, tapeworms, they can also be, they're flatworms. Um, they look like little segments, little pieces of rice. Um, the little segments, when they're shed in the feces, they're called froglitids, something that I did not know until going over all of this. Um, tapeworms can be really difficult to get rid of in an animal just because if they can break off into these little segments, each of those little segments can end up growing back into another parasite. So if you just miss one little froglitid, 
then you're still going to have that infection going on and they're still going to continue producing. Um, typically, you're going to end up seeing the diplidium canium. They can grow really, really long, up to like 20 inches. Um, but they're still in those little segments, which makes them difficult to get rid of. Um, the tania species is going to be more common, so in livestock, so like the goats and the sheep. Um, you'll see a poor haircut, maybe abdominal discomfort. Primarily, though, you're going to see the segments in the feces. One little segment breaks off and you look at it, it's obviously not a roundworm. It's obviously not a whipworm. It's obviously not a guardia. The little segment that looks like rice, you can look at that and be like, oh, it's obviously tapeworms. Um, the tapeworms, they can live in the lard and small intestine, but thankfully a dewormer should be able to go through and just flush them all out. Um, it may take a round or two of deworming to get every piece out of the tapeworms. And then when you give dewormer, you have to make sure that you're cleaning up the feces because that dewormer just flushes out their system. It's like a juice cleanse, but worse. So when they're getting cleaned out, you have to clean up that feces because not only in the not only is it a bunch of nasty feces, it's also all these tapeworms and you're going to see the eggs in there too. So you have to make sure you're cleaning up the feces when you go through and when you deworm an animal. So what you guys are going to work on, um, get what of it you can done, it's not due until Friday, um, is the diagnosis treatment worksheet. Um, I will have it uploaded to Edmodo and it will look like this. It's eight problems, you just have to go through. What is the animal sick with? How do you treat it? Some of it is diseases that we're gonna go over next class. And then some of it is parasites, which you should hopefully be able to answer most of these at this point. Um, like I said, though, I miss you guys and hope that I can see you guys soon. Um, reach out if you need anything, but I'll be putting up lectures, assignments, and I'm always free. Feel free to email me, message me, anything that you guys need. Um, I miss you guys and hopefully I'll get to see y'all soon.